Leviticus part 6 in the last lecture we had just finished up with God explaining to Israel what they shall and shall not do when they come finally to the land of Canaan and we're going to continue with that in this chapter 20 and we're going to see what it is that um, God says shall not be done by the children of Israel or the strangers that sojourn with them and he's going to make it quite clear what uh, what he will do if they do or what is to be done with them if they should take on the religions or the um, defilements of the land of Canaan so we're going to begin with Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 1 but before we do as always let us go unto our father before his throne and ask guidance and wisdom as we study this his great word Heavenly Father we come before you and we ask father that you lead us and guide us always in these studies we ask that your hand always be upon these studies father we ask that you give us the light that we may walk in it and see the truth we ask that you open the eyes and ears of those who study with us we ask that you bless us father with knowledge and wisdom and understanding of these things and spiritual type and example so that we may know what shall befall us in the end times and those things which you find unpleasing and we ask these things father in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Yeshua the true and only Messiah Amen Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 1 and the Lord spake unto Moses saying verse 2 again thou shalt say unto the children of Israel whosoever be of the children of Israel or of the stranger that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch he shall surely be put to death the people of the land shall stone him with stones now what he's talking about here I've already covered Moloch a number of times in past lectures but we'll talk about it again if a man gives his seed that means his posterity his children unto Moloch that means he is burning them with fire unto Baal this practice was called Moloch which means to put to fire so if a man is giving his own children to the fire in other words sacrificing unto Baal he shall be put to death and there is a type in this Moloch practice of modern-day churches scare people to church by telling them that if they don't come to their church that they're going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in hellfire well that's not the kind of father we have hell is clearly written of in the Bible as to what it is there are four definitions for hell and if you do not understand this I have a study called what is hell which will clear this up for you one of the meanings is a holding place for souls that did not overcome another is the uh, lake of fire in other words the place of the destruction of the soul the second death in other words as written in the book of Revelation but what we're talking about here is if a man gives his posterity his children his seed line unto Moloch in other words sacrifices them unto Baal puts them to the fire burns them alive as a sacrifice unto this false god Baal then he is guilty of murder and he shall surely be put to death and the people of the land shall stone him with stones verse 3 and I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name verse 4 and then the people of the land 
do in any ways hide their eyes from the man. This means if they turn a blind eye to it, where he giveth his seed unto Moloch, and kill him not, verse 5, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and will cut him off and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Moloch from among their people. In other words, this would be in the case of people know that he's doing it, but they haven't followed God's laws and stoned him to death if they turn a blind eye to it. In other words, this would be uh, kind of a hard thing to do, say if it was your father or your brother or a cousin or something. But if God has told you to do a thing, you do it. You put the love of God over the love of family. Verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and cut him off from among his people. Verse 7. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am holy, or I am the Lord your God. Verse 8. And ye shall keep my statues and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifies you. Verse 9. For every one that curses his father or his mother, he shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father and his mother, his blood shall be upon him. Uh, this word curses means to take vengeance upon his mother and father. In other words, maybe he didn't like the way he was raised. So he curses his father and mother. Um, this doesn't just mean to curse them verbally. A lot of people do that. And it still is wrong. Verse 10. And the man that commit adultery with another man's wife, even he that commit adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now I'm sure this is in the case, uh, assuming that they were both willing participants in this. Uh, this would not classify as if the man had raped the woman, or I would say vice versa, but... <laughs> If very few men were ever raped by a woman, but um, this is uh, assuming here that they're both willing participants in the act. And there's a dearer, deeper spiritual connotation with this also, that Christ is the true husband, and those that go whoring after another man or uh, in this case, another man's wife, is being unfaithful. And it's the same connotation that he is being unfaithful to his spouse. And he's going after something, uh, another man's nakedness, as far as the definition of another man's nakedness being his wife. And he shall surely be put to death for the crime of adultery. Now this is not fornication, this is adultery. And it is very akin to idolatry. Verse 11. And that man that lieth with his father's wife, and hath uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In other words, they would have to be uh, willing participants here too. Verse 12. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. For they have wrought confusion, and their blood shall be upon them. And in other words, this phrase, their blood shall be upon them, is they're getting their just reward. They have caused their own blood to be shed upon them. Verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with woman... Both of them have committed abomination, and they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, this was the law back then, and these laws were never supposed to be changed. Although, uh, the gay and homosexual, well, same thing, that lifestyle began coming out of the closet 
and be, making itself more known in the um, 50s. Actually, even farther back than that, but people kept it in the closet. But nowadays it's wide out in the open, and they even celebrate it with prideful parades and mimic sexual acts in front of children. Are these not the building blocks of Sodom and Gomorrah being rebuilt right before our very eyes? At any way, or at any rate, at this time, if you were caught doing that, you were to be put to death. And your blood was upon you. That means the people that killed you were not guilty of committing a crime. Because they're following the word of God. And people will say, well that's just barbaric to kill a person for something like that. Well, it's what God said to do. And since God created the world, and all souls, and all men, then he may make whatever rule he likes, and because man doesn't see it as fair, is of little consequence or little difference to God. God is not an unfair God. But this is to keep perversion. This is to keep filth. This is to keep defilement from the children of Israel. And these things were going on in the land of Canaan, and this is why we're covering these verses. <coughs> Even though we're some, at this time of this writing, some 30-something years away from entering the land of Canaan, God is preparing his people for the day that sh they shall enter the promised land, and I might add, more ways than one entering the promised land. Not only that land of Canaan, but the promised land of these end times. Verse 14. If a man shall, and if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. And they shall be burnt with fire, both he and they. There shall be no wickedness among you. Verse 15. And if a man lie with beast, he shall surely be put to death. And you shall slay the beast. And, uh,. This is, of course, bestiality, and it's practiced now. I mean, there are people that do it. Verse 16, no matter how perverse it is, mankind seems to love to thrill himself with all kinds of little flesh-pleasing perversions. Verse 16, and if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down thereunto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Um, the woman lying down here would be to, for the beast to uh, uh, make insertion to her, of course. And um, the beast should probably know better. Uh, most animals know of their own instinct not to breed with another set of animals. There are some that do, but uh, I mean there are certain different kinds of cats and dogs in the world that are uh, can be put into a cage and they will breed with each other and it brings a, a new pedigree out. But many times there are problems with these animals. They develop all kinds of uh, health problems or arthritis or many other things because they've been breeded rather than letting nature take its course. It's always better to stay with nature. Verse 17. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, to see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing. They shall be cut off from the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. Verse 18. And if a man shall lie with woman in her sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, and discovered her fountain, and hath uncovered her fountain of her blood, in other words, this means while she's in her menstrual cycle, then both of them shall be cut off from among their people. In other words, Again, these were perversions, these were filth. They may be commonplace today. People may do it, even husband and wife, but it, it's not pleasing unto God. 
Because in these times, uh, well, I, not only those times, that uh, uh, biblical times, but as it is now, uh, if a man were to sleep with a woman and be in the fountain of her blood, and um, then later be with someone else, then you're going to spread disease around, and you're going to get sexually transmitted diseases and such, and this is what happens when people do not obey the laws of God. Verse 19. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor thy father's sister. For he that uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. Verse 20. If a man lie with his uncle's wife, and hath uncovered her nakedness, they shall bear their sin, and they shall die childless. Now, uh, it is God that places the soul in the womb. And um, that's probably what's being referred to, is he would not give them any children. Verse 21. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Now again, I had mentioned before there is only a few cases written of in the Bible where uh, if, uh, if there are two brothers and one die before he has a chance to raise children up to him, in other words, to raise seed up to him, there was a statute where the brother could go in and raise up seed, raise up seed to his brother so that his brother's name be not cut off from the people. But this is talking about uh, like I said, screwing around with his brother's wife. Verse 22. He shall therefore keep my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land, whither I bring you to dwell in, spew you not out. Verse 23. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they have committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. Now, a lot of people have not understood why God sent Israel in and told him to kill off all these people. Well, you're reading some of the reasons right now. Uh, one of the other reasons, which is probably not mentioned here, it may be mentioned later or not, but was there was a second influx of fallen angels... And there were giants in the land again, after the flood of Noah. And the people were cut off for that reason as well. Because they had the seed of the Gibor, the seed of the Nephilim, the fallen angels, and they were, um, as we get along through the Bible, you will see that there were Raphim, Anakims, or Anakims, and uh, they were the giants. And as a matter of fact, there have been giants, uh, skeletons found in the Middle East, and even in Europe, and assumedly the ones that were found in Europe were uh, carried from the Middle East and put in Europe, uh, no doubt for um, the reasons of uh, archaeological or... Um, the science of the time that they were carried there and probably as a remembrance of the giants but all the giants were eventually killed off uh, verse 24 but I have said unto you ye shall inherit the land and I will give it to you to possess it a land that floweth with milk and honey I am the Lord your God which have separated you from other people in other words, you've been set aside from the rest of the world. Now, this does not mean that Israel is any better than anyone else. It simply means that God chose them to fulfill his promise, to fulfill his wishes, and to do a job. And part of doing that job was to remain clean and be holy as he was. A lot of people put too much emphasis on the name Israel. Um... I've done a study called the Lost Tribes of Israel, which explains where the tribes migrated to, and I get at least 10 or 12 uh, hateful messages a week 
because I speak the truth from the Bible and from historical writings, both ancient and more latter, of who Israel is. And people have always hated the truth. They hated the truth when Christ spoke it, when the prophets spoke it, when the apostles spoke it, and even when Christians since the apostles spoke it. And they hate it now just as bad. Nevertheless, the truth is the truth. It will not be diminished. And uh, the majority are most often wrong. So, when I get these emails, it really does not deter me one iota. I simply answer them until I get to a point where I feel I've done enough. And then I'll break off contact with the person. And... Um, you know, because there are some people, you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And you cannot give eyes to see to anyone who doesn't want to see, nor can you give eyes to see to anyone that God Almighty himself will not allow to see. And there are some that God will not allow to see, and this was the reason Christ spoke in parables. I spoke in parables, therefore some by hearing may not perceive, and by uh, seeing may not understand as it is written uh, let's see where were we verse 25 ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean between unclean fowls and clean ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or in any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. In other words, we covered the food laws just a little bit ago, and those food laws are very much still intact. I know that there are people that believe that Peter's vision of the sheet coming down from heaven with the unclean animals on it made it where you could eat any animal, but in um, saying, making that statement, they show their ignorance to what the vision that Peter was given actually meant. It meant that he should call no man common. And he understood that and even wrote of it himself. But people don't necessarily read every verse of the Bible. They read and see what they want to see and make assessments from that. And therefore they do err. Verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I am the Lord. I, I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Verse 27. A man also, or a woman, that hath a familiar spirit, that is a wizard, in other words, a spirit charmer, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, and their blood shall be upon them. In other words, this would be the case of a woman who... Um, invited the spirit in, or a man, a necromancer, a spirit charmer. We were not to speak to unfamiliar spirits, because unfamiliar spirits most often times, well, virtually every time, unless God allowed it, was a demonic voice. And it was a demonic voice that spoke through Mary Margaret MacDonald in the year 1830 and revamped and reignited the rapture doctrine. In other words, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. But if you want to study that, I have a, sub a study called the rapture and deception and unawares. We're not going to cover that now. Let's move on to Leviticus chapter 21. So Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, there shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. In other words, none of the priests shall be defiled for the reason of the dead among the people. Uh, whether it be a kinfolk, uh, well, it will, it will be covered here, verse 2. But for his kin that is near unto him, that is, for his mother, or for his father, or for his son, or for his daughter, or for his brother, verse 3, and for his sister, a virgin, that is nigh unto him, which had no husband, for her he may be defiled. In other words, um, defiled means 
when you go near a dead person or even touch a dead person and many people do if their mother dies they hold their hand or their father to say goodbye and uh, man is no different now than he's ever been it still hurts when we lose a loved one and God said for these you may defile yourself and the, this Leviticus 21 is talking to the priests the, Levi the Levites verse 4 but he shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people to profane himself verse 5 he shall not make baldness upon their head neither shall they save, shave off the corners of their beard nor make any cuttings in their flesh and we covered this in the last lecture these were all things that were done by um, the people of the land of Canaan in other words they shaved their heads it, it, and this has more to do than just being a um, a style in other words a lot of people shave their heads now uh, whether they're going bald or not but baldness here especially to the priest line is symbolic of not having the veil covering you and the veil is of course Jesus Christ nor shall they shave the corner of their beard nor make any cuttings in their flesh in other words you shall not defile your body because someone has died in the process of mourning you shall not do these things verse 6 they shall be holy unto their God and not profane the name of their God for the offerings of the Lord made by fire and for the bread of their God they do offer therefore shall they be holy verse 7 they shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane neither shall they make take a woman put away from her husband for he is holy unto God in other words the priest line was not allowed to marry a whore or a woman who had been put away by her husband in other words a divorced woman and uh, there are deeper implications even to this with the book of revelations and mystery Babylon and various other spiritual connotations written in the Word of God but um, again in this Old Testament you get a type of the New Testament in other words a priest shall not marry a whore well what is the harlot of Babylon symbolic of a whore why because she sleeps with the wrong husband she doesn't wait for the true Christ she falls to the Antichrist and uh, the same is true of a woman that has been put away from her husband because she is defiled and the priest line shall not partake of anything that is defiled whether it be food or um, ceremony or a woman or anything the priests were to be holy unto God verse 8 thou shalt sanctify him therefore that he offereth the bread of thy God and he shall be holy unto thee for I the Lord which sanctify you am holy verse 9 and the daughter of any priest if she profane herself by playing the whore she profaneth her father and she shall be burnt with fire In other words, she uh, dirties her father's name. And for doing that, she shall be burnt with fire. And again, there's a deeper connotation to this of uh, even hell. Anyone that profanes their father, and uh, there's a connotation here of if you profane your father, your heavenly father, you could end up in hell fire. Verse 10. And he that is a high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured that is consecrated to put on the garments that is the holy garments and not cover his head nor rend his clothes or shall not cover uncover his head nor rend his clothes verse 13 neither how shall he go in to any dead body nor defile himself for his father or for his mother now this is for the high priest okay that's the difference between the uh, earlier priest that would mention that could defile himself. But the high priest that was anointed with the oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, symbolic of the truth, is not allowed to defile himself 
even to go into a dead body of his father or his mother. Verse 12. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of God, for the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. In other words, that oil is special. It is symbolic, again, of the Holy Spirit. It is symbolic of the Holy Truth. It is symbolic of God. The word is Eliyah in Hebrew. Olive oil, verse 13. And he shall take a wife in her virginity. Verse 14. A widow or a divorced woman or profane or an harlot, these shall he not take. But he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. That means she must be a Levite. And this is covered later in the book of Luke concerning uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, and his wife, which were um, cousins unto Mary, the mother of Jesus. In other words, even uh, in that time, um, uh, about the time of Christ's birth, this law was still in effect. A Levite man could only marry a Levite woman if he was in the priesthood. And uh, whether he was a high priest or a uh, lower priest, he could only marry a Levitical woman. So she had to be of his tribe. She could not be uh, even of one of the other tribes of Israel. It was illegal. Now, a man who was a Levite who was not consecrated to be a priest could intermarry with another of the children of Israel, but not a Levite priest. Verse 15. Neither shall he profane his seed among the people, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. And of course, his seed is his posterity, his children. Verse 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 17, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whatsoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath a blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Verse 18. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he hath he shall not approach a blind man, or lame, or he that has a flat nose, or anything super, superfluous. Um, this may seem to be a little bit um, strict, but it was the law of God. Um, first of all, these people could not perform the duty. A blind man could not see to do it. A lame man would not be able to do it. He that has a flat nose, flat nose here means mutilated. It, it can mean anything from um, a birth defect to something else. Anything superfluous. In other words, anything that uh, made his nose uh, or, or his face even uh, with blemish. And the reason for this, again, is because the Levitical priest line were supposed to be unblemished. So, you know, God does not love the child any less, but they cannot be a priest. And like I said, some of these things may seem like they're a little bit strict, but this was the law of God. And if God said it, then it was fair. Verse 19. Or a man that is broken-footed or broken-handed. Uh, this means uh, had broken his leg and uh, was not able to get it put back. In other words, probably walked with a limp or had a twisted limb or broken-handed. And uh, in order to make wave offerings and to do the things of a priesthood, if you had any of these, you would probably not be able to do the office. So, therefore, these are written. Verse 20, or crooked back, or dwarf, and this dwarf is not necessarily as what we think of as midget. It's, it really means thin, as in too thin. Or that has a blemish in his eye, or scurvy, or scabbed, or he that hath his stones broken. And 
uh, stones here would um, refer to a man's genitals, his reproductive uh, uh, stones, you might, you might say. Um, I, I don't really want to go very much farther than that with this, but uh, in other words, he can't reproduce and uh, he could not carry on his seed line, his priesthood, the with sons or with daughters or what have you. Verse 21. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest shall come nigh to offer offerings unto the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer bread of his God. In other words, he shall not um, do the office of the priest. This does not mean he cannot uh, bring an animal to be offered as a sacrifice or uh, any of the other things, but he cannot hold the office of priest. In other words, the priest's line was to be unblemished and to be perfect. And when I say perfect, I mean as perfect as it could be, according to these rules that we're reading of now. Verse 22. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy. Verse 23. Only he shall not go in unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish. So you see there, he uh, shall be able to eat the bread of God, the holy and the most holy, but he shall not go into the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish. That he profane not my sanctuary, for I the Lord do sanctify them. Verse 24. And Moses told it unto Aaron, and to his sons, and to all the children of Israel. Leviticus chapter 22 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, that they profane not my holy name in those things which they hallow unto me. I am the Lord. Verse 3. You see this statement made quite often. I am the Lord. Well, that, that's God letting you know that's his office. His name is even involved in that. I am. Yah. Verse 3. Say unto them, Whosoever he be of you, of your seed, among your generations, that means from now on, your posterity, your children's children, and so on, that goeth into the holy things which the children of Israel hallow upon the Lord, having his uncleanliness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Verse 4. What man soever of the seed of Aaron is a leper, or hath a running issue, he shall not eat of the holy things until he be clean. And whosoever toucheth anything that, that is unclean by the dead, or a man whose seed goeth forth from him, verse 5, or whosoever toucheth any creeping thing whereby he may be made unclean, or a man who may be may take uncleanliness whatsoever clean, uncleanliness he hath in other words by whatever uncleanliness out of all these uh, statutes and rules that we've been reading verse 6 the soul which hath touched any such shall be unclean until even and he shall not eat of the holy things unless he wash his flesh in water verse 7 and when the sun is down he shall be clean Again, the Hebrew day began at the going down of the sun. And he shall afterward eat the holy things, because it is his food. Verse 8. That the diet... diet <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that that dieth of itself, or that is torn by beast, he shall not eat to defile himself therewith. I am the Lord. Verse 9. They shall therefore keep mine ordinance, lest they bear sin for it, and die therefore, if they profane it. I, the Lord, do sanctify them. And again, think of all the spiritual connotations you can attach to this. That the priest line must be holy, they must not partake of any unclean thing, they must not touch any dead thing, and this also pertains to religion. Because if you are teaching a false doctrine, false doctrine, 
You are touching a dead thing. It has no life to it. If you teach the untruth, you are leading the children away from their father toward death and not towards God. Verse 10. There shall be no stranger eat of the holy thing, a sojourner of the priest, or an hired servant, shall not eat any or shall not eat of the holy thing. Verse 11. But if the priest buy a soul with his money, he shall eat it. And he that is born in his house, they shall eat of his meat. Verse 12. If the priest's daughter also be married unto a stranger, she may not eat of the offering of the holy things. And again, this stranger, is you're going to find out, means one who is not an Israelite. And God will even go so far as later in the book of the Bible to say that the children of Israel shall not intermarry with the other peoples of the earth. And I know that some upon hearing that will say, well, that's a racist doctrine. It is not. It is the word of God. The children produced of this union of an Israelite and Hebrew uh, of the tribes of Israel and a person of another race was called a mamzer. And a mamzer is translated in the Bible under the word bastard. And it means a person of no people because if Israel went to war with the people and let's say the mother was of the race of the people and the father was of Israel then the child would have nowhere to run to because they would not be of either people. He would not be accepted of the Israelites because he was not full Israel and he would not be accepted of the other people because he was not fully their people. So there's nothing racist in this. And I'm not reading anything into this of my own free will. If you don't believe it, you can check these things out in the Hebrew for yourself. And if you don't, you have no one to blame but yourself. But look up the word bastard and look at the definition. It is the word mamzer. Verse 13. But if the priest's daughter be a widow or divorced and have no child and is returned unto her father's house as in her youth, she shall eat of her father's meat. But there shall be no stranger eat thereof. Verse 14. And if a man eateth of the holy thing unwittingly, then he shall put the fifth part thereunto it, and shall give it unto the priest with the holy thing. In other words, he shall uh, pay a fifth part beyond it, and return the holy thing. Verse 15. And if they shall not profane the holy things of the children of Israel, which they are... Excuse me, verse 15. And they shall not profane the holy things of the children of Israel which they offer unto the Lord. And again, uh, th there's so much you could add to this verse in, in our modern times. Our offering to the Lord is our unrequited love. And you're not to profane that. Well, how could you profane it? Well, by believing false doctrines, by falling and worshiping the wrong Christ. By doing things that you know better than you ought to do. And not repenting of them. Verse 16. Or suffer them to bear the iniquity of their trespass when they eat their holy things. For I am the Lord, or I the Lord do sanctify them. Verse 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Verse 18. Speak unto Aaron and his sons, and to all the children of Israel, and say unto them, Whatsoever he be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers in Israel, that will offer his oblation, which is his sacrifice, for all his vows, and for all his free will offerings, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering, verse 19, ye shall offer at your own will a male without blemish, of, be of the beeves and of the sheep and of the goats or goats blah tongue twisting old English you gotta love it but anyway um, in other words your offering was to be made of your own free will that's first and foremost that you make it of your own free will 
that you come to the Lord. Second, it shall be a male without blemish. Well, what was Christ? A male without blemish. A male without sin who spake only the truth. And then you've got the animals here. The beeves, uh, oxen. Verse 20. Or uh, cattle, rather. Uh, verse 20. But whosoever hath a blemish, that ye shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. Or whatsoever, not whosoever. But whatsoever hath a blemish, that ye shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable unto you. Okay, so Christianity saves us and makes us acceptable to the Lord. But false doctrine does not make us acceptable unto the Lord. So think about that as you think about the religions of the world and the denominations in Christianity which are teaching untruths. Christ addressed the seven churches in the book of Revelation and there were only two that he was pleased with that he found no fault with. And they both taught and shared the same set of values and the same doctrine. You'd be wise to learn of them. There's Smyrna and Philadelphia. Verse 21. And whosoever offereth the sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a freewill offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Again, always it's to be unblemished, as Christ was unblemished. Verse 22. Blind, or broken, or maimed, or having a win, or scurvy, or scabbed, ye shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire upon them, or upon the altar of the Lord. In other words, an animal that was diseased, or was injured, or that had any sort of a blemish, was not acceptable to God. This is how we know that the offering was supposed to be the best of what you had, your best animal, the best of your flock. And this is why Cain's offering was not accepted when he made his offering before the Lord. Because he kept the best for himself. And that is the trademark of the Kenite. To use false weights and balances and to keep the best for themselves and to give God the seconds. Well, God is our Creator and our Father and he deserves better than the seconds. Verse 23. Either a bullock or a lamb that hath anything superfluous or is lacking any parts, thou mayest offer for a freewill offering, but, a vow, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. Verse 24. Ye shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised or crushed or broken or cut, Neither shall you make any offering thereof in your hand. In other words, by your hand. Verse 25. Neither from a stranger's hand shall you offer the bread of your God of any of these. Because there is corruption in them and blemishes in them that they shall not be accepted from you. Verse 27. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying... Or verse 26, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Verse 27, When a bullock, or a sheep, or a goat is brought forth, then it shall be seven days under the dam, and on the eighth day from henceforth it shall be accepted for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And uh, seven days under the dam here means seven days since its birth. And um, this is one of the things that I have a little bit of trouble with. But it is our Father's Word, so that is the way it is. But such a young animal having to be sacrificed has always bothered the animal lover side of me. But then again, the soul of the animal returns to the Father. And animals do have souls. It is written that the lion shall lie down with the lamb. So, it was our Father's anyway, whether it dwells in the flesh or whether it dwells in heaven. Verse 28. Whether it be cow or you, ye shall not kill it and her young both in one day. In other words, you shall not kill the mother and the baby 
both in one day. Verse 29. And when you shall offer a, th a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord, offer it at your own free will. Now, many people today don't even give thanks at the dinner table for the food they eat. And that is the sacrifice today of thanksgiving, or, or for any, any good fortune that God has bestowed upon you, or any blessing. It may be just for uh, the air you breathe, or for another day in this life. Which this life is trying, and there's a lot of tribulation in it, and a lot of testing, and a lot of struggles, and a lot of aggravation, and a lot of cursing, and this, that, and the other. But every day being alive is a good day, and we should always thank our Father for that. Again, this is uh, a spiritual uh, connotation to this verse that I'm giving you. Verse 30. On the same day it shall be eaten up, and ye shall leave none until the until the morrow. I am the Lord. Verse 21. Therefore keep ye my commandments, and do them. I am the Lord. And fully translated, fully translated this should say, Therefore keep ye my commandments, and do them. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. Verse 32, Neither shall they profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallowed you, verse 33, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Again, that sacred name, e -yah, I am. And I wanted to get farther than this, but... I think we will stop here because we're already almost up to that hour and I'm trying to keep these things about an hour or less. I've run over a couple of times due to subject matter and longer chapters but um, I think we will stop this lecture here and we'll, we'll begin with verse uh, or chapter 23 in the next lecture. But be thankful brothers and sisters in Christ. Give your thanksgiving unto the Lord, and offer it without blemish. In other words, make sure that your doctrine is sure. Study the word of your Father to show yourself approved, that you be not corrupt, that you be not against Him inadvertently or accidentally. Because there are many churches out there right now who think themselves to do a good work. When really they are leading people away from God and to the feet of Satan from the doctrines that they teach. Sure, they teach that Christ is the Lord and they teach all of these old things that they, uh, it, to their ability to understand them. But they also teach false doctrines such as again the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. There is no such thing as the pre-tribulation rapture. Christ told us exactly how he would return. He gave us the seven seals, the seven vials, the seven trumpets to let us know the order of events and the most important things involved with his return. He outlined it in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. And he spake it clearly so that we could understand the order of events. Yet people still preach, you better be ready, you better be ready for the rapture because cars are going to be running off the road without inhabitant and uh, clothes are going to fall and hit the ground and, and we're just all going to fly away in the sky. I suggest for those of you that believe that, you read Ezekiel 13 along with the other verses I mentioned and if you need to back this up to relist those verses, I suggest you do so. Because you don't want to be caught naked before the Lord. And I mean spiritually naked, not physically naked. He knows what you look like in your nakedness. But as always, brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my prayer for you that you will take the Word of God seriously. 
that you will study these things to show yourself approved, that you will dig deep into the word and feast upon it and dig into the treasures therein and search for the hidden messages. And I don't mean the kind like the men do when they uh, take their little biblical codes and say, oh, we predicted John Kennedy's death and Lincoln's death. Sure, they can predict anything after the fact. How come they can't predict it before? Because it's what we in the uh, uh, business of discernment call um, bullpucky, uh, for want of a better euphemism, which is a nice word. But um, at any rate, don't let yourself be caught short. Don't fall to deception. It's getting late in the day. Our Father has given us His Word, and it's incumbent upon you to read it and do your best to understand it. And He counts that if you're trying. But He's also given us tools to study His Word with. And I suggest you obtain some of them, such as the Strong's Concordance, the Green's Interlinear, the Apocrypha, if you can, the Masoretic Texts, uh, a Good Companion Bible by E.W. Bullinger, the Smith's Bible Dictionary. There are many tools you can use to study the Word in great depth and find out what these sayings mean and understand these Hebraisms and these Grecianisms and understand what the people were talking about through the volume of this entire book. At any rate, may our Father bless you in your study and may He richly pour out to you His truth and give you deeper understanding and to drink of that fountain of water of which ye shall never thirst again. Thank you for listening. This has been just.